um, oops, yeah, that one right there. And uh, you might want to screenshot this or use your QR code reader, but this is a part of a series of webinars. And we have a couple, we have four more coming up this spring, maybe five actually, we're working with partners at DNR to do one more. Um, and you can see the dates there, but uh, we'll put the slide up again at the end. And if you heard about this one, you'll probably hear about the other ones as well, because <laughs> we'll be emailing and promoting them in the same ways. Um, all right, I guess with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to Ron. Um, and just please keep in mind, keep yourself on mute if that's okay. If you do have questions, we really encourage you to put those into the chat box and Krista, myself and Elise will all be monitoring that throughout this entire webinar. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll give it to Ron and, and Ron, take it away, please. Yeah, thanks Bart. I was just looking through the chat to see where everyone's from or the people who entered into the chat, uh, their schools and their uh, cities. That's really great to see uh, so many people from across the region. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about uh, satellite data of Chesapeake Bay and how uh, that gets analyzed for understanding the environment. And like Bart said, we'll have you do a little bit of that yourself. Uh, let's, uh, we're, I'm with the University of Maryland and I do grant work for NOAA's Coast Watch project. And uh, Bart, you probably, you probably know Bart, uh, he's with NOAA's Chesapeake Bay office. So just an outline, I'll give a brief intro to satellites and oceanographic satellite data types. Uh, then I'll talk about a case study of how satellites uh, help to answer an environmental question in Chesapeake Bay. And then I'll talk briefly about accessing satellite data and then Bart will take over and uh, give you an educational example about an environmental problem. And then I will come back and do a demo of a data analysis tool that's uh, on, the, on the World Wide Web. And then we turn it over to you. You will have a sandbox time, meaning that you'll have some hands-on play time with that data analysis tool. Uh, that'll be at just a couple minutes. Um, uh, then we'll uh, come back and uh, have some discussion about uh, a potential education application that, that uses data analysis of satellite data. So um, this is a poll question. I don't know if Elise or Krista are conducting a poll, but uh, we wanted to ask how have you used satellite data? So I don't know, are we using the chat? Yeah, we're just gonna use the chat function. So if people wanna write in how they're currently using satellite data into the chat. Yeah, and um, I mean, we know uh, that there, uh, we see satellite data quite frequently. Um, so uh, if you have a one that you use, um, uh, such as looking at weather conditions or land cover, or even looking at environmental conditions of Chesapeake Bay, or even uh, looking at your house uh, or your neighborhood. Um, let me see if I can get to the chat. And while, uh, while Ron is queuing that up, um, I heard from a couple people that it's, the audio might be a little rough and I apologize for that. I don't have any short-term fixes except um, just to, to ask that, um, you know, if your webcam is off, that's great. That might help a little bit. Uh, but um, I guess the only other potential option would be to, to call in, but um, I'll try and put that number into the, the chat box. In case. So Ron, it, it looks like people are mentioning uh, looking for their watershed address. Um, weather conditions, a few people said they use it for all the bullets you have listed. Yeah, I see that too, that uh, some people are looking at satellite data uh, across a broad spectrum. That's really great. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Our uh, flood maps, I see uh, census, U.S. census work, uh, really interesting stuff. Wow, you're all... Uh, uh, you're all on the on the go with satellite data already. I hope I can add something <laughs> uh, to what you're already looking at. Um, 
Okay, so uh, why use satellite data? Satellite data uh, provides information where we can't get field measurements or where it's not practical to get field measurements. Uh, it also gives us broad spatial coverage with periodic observations at some um, uh, uh, consistent interval. So, uh, for example, satellite data on a daily basis. Um, and those, uh, those are both really great, the broad spatial coverage for detecting spatial patterns and that uh, periodic frequency and observation for monitoring change over time. And uh, you can see from the example, we get the full uh, expanse, we get data for all of Chesapeake Bay. So that's what's our broad spatial coverage. And you can see uh, here, looking at two days, uh, it's probably cut off on your screen, but this is October, a day in October of 2019, and this is a day of November in 2019. So you can see it's just a very simple example. That's what we would expect the uh, temperature is uh, decreasing over that month. So that's what we mean by change over time. Uh, so you might be thinking, oh, wow, satellite data is great. It gives us a lot. We can use satellite data for everything. But there is a very important caveat. This satellite only gives us uh, information for the surface. So we do need all those other kinds of data, the um, uh, ship data, the buoy data, in order to understand more about the, uh, the bay or the ocean than, um, uh, than what just the satellite gives us, for example, the water in three dimensions. Uh, so, oh, okay, unfortunately we've switched to PDF. So I can't show you the video, but there are several types of um, uh, different kinds of satellites used in observing the Earth. And one of them is called polar orbiting satellites. And as the name suggests, what you would be seeing in the video is a satellite going around the Earth from the North Pole to the South Pole and then back up on the reverse side and then repeating, always orbiting the Earth from the North Pole to the South Pole. And as it's doing this, it's the Earth that's turning underneath of the satellite. So that satellite is um, uh, collecting data. Um, and as the Earth is turning, then uh, more and more data is collected over that, um, uh, over uh, or from the surface of the Earth. So uh, the way it's configured over 14 orbits of the satellite and one turn of the Earth, uh, one day of the Earth, um, we get uh, data for almost the entire Earth. So uh, that's what gives us the uh, daily frequency. And that's what gives us for any point on the Earth on any day, we, can, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a data observation from the satellite for any point on the Earth every day. So here are some oceanographic satellite data types that are relevant to Chesapeake Bay. I already showed you temperature. So here I'm kind of zooming out to show you the water temperature. We also call that sea surface temperature. Um, zooming out to the Atlantic with satellites, we can see the Gulf Stream really well, uh, that warm water coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, uh, the, uh, of course, as uh, you all have seen, satellites take a picture the way a camera takes a picture. We call that true color. And then there are other products um, from satellite, the water turbidity, the suspended sediment concentration we can calculate from satellite data and the chlorophyll concentration. And as you know, the chlorophyll is the green pigment in plants and as well for the ocean and phytoplankton and algae. So we get a sense from the chlorophyll that we can calculate, um, or we get a sense of how much phytoplankton is in the water. So now I'm going to give you, uh, I'll talk about a case study, an example of how satellites uh, were used to address an environmental question. And our question is, or society's question, is what is the impact of severe storms on Chesapeake Bay? 
And this question is very, very relevant because we know from climate change that the Northeast of North America will become a lot wetter. Uh, there'll be more rainstorms, more frequent rainstorms, uh, and more severe rainstorms. And we had a really interesting case in 2011 with Tropical Storm Lee um, that occurred in uh, September, and uh, that storm dumped a lot of water onto the Susquehanna River watershed. And uh, as that uh, water fell, the land, the runoff, the rain runoff from the land was carrying a lot of sediment as well as all kinds of other stuff, garbage, debris, trees, all that kind of thing uh, down into the Chesapeake Bay. And we had the um, one of the two worst sediment plumes in our known history uh, happened in that event. And uh, the sediment plume extended almost halfway down the Chesapeake Bay. But we're, what we were able to do with satellites was track that plume over, over time. Um, this is an example of three days, but we could track that plume for almost a month. And um, people were very interested in being able to track the plume because the sediment um, has an impact on the ecology and on human activities. So, for example, power plants were really interested uh, because they wanted to guard their water intakes um, from all that garbage and trees uh, from coming into the power plant. So they wanted to know the location of the plume so they could shut their water intake. Uh, similarly, the submerged aquatic vegetation with all that sediment that can be smothered and that will have a um, uh, this uh, vegetation is a nursery ground for fish. Um, so uh, if the veg vegetation is smothered, then there's less habitat and uh, fisheries ecologists and fisheries uh, resource managers um, uh, want to understand if, if there's less nursery ground, then in future years, there could be fewer fish um, that would impact the fishing industry. So the location of that plume, um, understanding its impacts was really important. And this keeps happening now. Uh, the second half of 2018 was the wettest period in the historical record for uh, the mid-Atlantic. And that uh, continued as a very wet period into 2019. And during that period, we were able to track the um, track the plume for individual rainstorms. I want to point out here on the graph, this is the water flow into the, uh, from the Susquehanna River into the Chesapeake Bay. And the orange line is the 50 year average flow. Now compared with that is the blue line for this time period. And you can see uh, the amount of flow is orders of magnitude higher than the average flow. And then on top of that, there were these rain events. So there was an enormous amount of water coming into Chesapeake Bay uh, and um, uh, scientists and environmental managers were very interested in knowing, um, uh, knowing what the impacts of all that rain could be. So um, I just gave you a lot of information. We're gonna pause for questions. I got, I don't know. If People can ask, or are we looking at the trying to open my chat here? Yeah, and yeah, Krista. People can, oh, sorry, people can submit any questions they have for Ron in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing questions, so. Um, Maybe. Um, Ron, there's a there's a couple questions about uh, being able to share this PowerPoint. And uh, just before we turn towards taking a look at the actual data tools and playing with the um, the Earth app tool, we'll we'll put a, a link to where you can actually get those in the um, in the chat box, uh, and we can we can put them in there sooner and later, and we might actually put them in there a couple of times just so you have access to where they'll live, um, you know, for whenever you need it. Um, cool. 
All right, we'll move on then. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about uh, accessing satellite data. And uh, there's lots out there, as, uh, as uh, we saw, you all know already, there are lots of ways to get satellite data online. But I'm going to show you two very briefly. One is the Daily Map Viewer from NOAA Coastwatch, and that gives a, uh, the latest satellite image updated on a daily basis for the East Coast and for uh, several different water quality parameters measured by satellite. So temperature, chlorophyll, turbidity, sediment, um, and then you can zoom to your area. Uh, and if you click on one, uh, say we click on Chesapeake Bay, then you get uh, the same for Chesapeake Bay. You can select different uh, per, uh, parameters. Um, and on this page, you can go back in time. So you can select uh, the imagery for the day uh, for, uh, uh, for earlier days. And there's uh, years of data worth um, uh, images uh, on this site. So you can go back and look at conditions in Chesapeake Bay for earlier, earlier times. So the other tool that I'm uh, going to mention and that we'll uh, dive into more is called ERDAP. And that's a data visualization and analysis tool that's right on the web. Um, so you can do things like make maps and graphs of, um, of satellite data. And the interface looks like this on the right hand side. Uh, and uh, what I did just to show you, well, I'll do a demo uh, in a little bit, but just to show you uh, some of the capability is that uh, with this temperature data set, I made a map, a map of Chesapeake Bay temperature. And then I also made a, um, a trend graph of how temperature is changing over time. So there's some uh, number of years here, and what you're seeing is the change in temperature from summertime to wintertime for a bunch of years. So you can do that kind of uh, graphing also. And the neat thing that uh, because it's a web uh, tool, you can uh, share your what you can share what you made with other people. So you can share the web link to your graph, for example, and then other people can pull up exactly what it is that you made uh, or your map. Uh, you can also download the uh, image of what you made or uh, download the data uh, behind the data behind the image. So there are lots of ways to share um, with, uh, with ERDAP. And I think that's uh, cool for uh, educators and for classrooms. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Bart and um, Bart will uh, give us an education example. Thanks, Ron. Um, so yeah, it was, it was funny when you were showing uh, the sediment plume coming down the Chesapeake Bay from that storm in 2011 and then again in 2018. Like I, I know personally that I drive over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge every once in a while and just seeing the like the chocolate milk coloration in the bay was amazing. When I got home, I was I totally checked out the satellite data just to see how far that plume extended. And um, that was that was a big one though. 2018 was really big. There's a lot of junk out there. but. And, and I guess my point is that um, satellite data pr provides us with that really unique perspective for, for looking at this long-term data uh, about the Chesapeake Bay and, and really the, the global oceans. Um, so, uh, and I like, to, I like to think about phenomenon out there that occur every once in a while and, um, and how we might be able to use data to, to learn a little bit about that phenomenon. And one of them actually happened back around a similar time to the data that, uh, that Ron was mentioning where all the red, the, the precipitation occurred in 2011. And this is, uh, I don't know if folks remember this, but um, just north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge um, and pretty much across the entire Chesapeake, um, there were millions of fish that just washed up dead on the beaches in the Eastern shore, mostly in Kent and Queen Anne's counties. And uh, hopefully you can see that picture there, but that, that's kind of what the beaches looked for, like for a little bit. And this doesn't happen a lot. It happens occasionally in the bay. Um, but this large fish kill is one of those phenomenon that, that you know, caused a lot of concern out there. Um, and Ron, you can go ahead and click to the next slide, please. Cool. 
so so the question is, and this is one of those poll questions that you can chat your your thinking in to the box on. But what, what do you think actually might have killed those fish? I, I listed a couple, you know, on the slide. But go ahead and and you know put what you think might have done it um, into the chat box. The options are like disease, maybe a lack of food low dissolved oxygen, some kind of pollution events, maybe a change in salinity, a change in temperature, maybe something something else out there. Like it. Low DO, um, maybe a lack of plant life, places for those things to hide, uh, increased sediment, awesome. Change in salinity. Be thinking as you're, you know, maybe you're checking out this chat um, and the stuff that's in there. And um, you're thinking like, what might cause those things to actually happen too? Um, great responses. Yeah, low DO seems to be winning the pack. And if we could have done a poll question on this tool, we would have, because I would have loved to see those bars about you know what people are thinking. Um, but yeah, a couple more. We got some pollution, poor stormwater management. I love it. Um, awesome. So there's a lot of potential causes. Ron, can you go ahead and click to that next uh, slide? Um, and, and when we're thinking about those causes and feel free to keep on putting them in, um, you know, it's important to know just a little bit about these fish. So the fish that died and washed up were these things called spots. And you can see the picture of what they look like right there on the screen. But you know, their habitat, they actually um, spend most of their adult life or a good chunk of it out in the Atlantic, but they do come in, uh, they do spawn in the Atlantic, but those young fish come to the nursery estuaries around the East Coast, like the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and then they kind of hang out there in the shallows, eat and grow big and fat, or as big and fat as a spot gets. And then eventually they migrate back into the Atlantic in the late fall and winter. Um, they're bottom feeders, so they eat plankton, they eat or vertebrates, they eat some other small fish that exist out there. And then in terms of water quality conditions, uh, dissolved oxygen, it needs to be greater than 0.8. And yes, you are seeing that right, 0.8 milligrams per liter or parts per million. Um, their salinity tolerance is they can they can actually live in pretty fresh water, but they like brackish to marine waters. And their temperature tolerance, they like to have water that's above 10 degrees Celsius. That doesn't mean super warm. I didn't put the top end in, but just something above 10 degrees uh, Celsius, and they are they're pretty happy. And the last thing, they taste great. If you've ever tried one, they're delicious fish. So Ron, you can go ahead and, and click next, please. Um, yeah, I I think they are a drum family. They're they're a little bit like. Um, croaker and stuff along those lines. Oops, thanks. Um, so we're just going to explore a couple of the potential uh, causes. And survey did say low dissolved oxygen was the number one uh, potential cause. So we're going to look at that really quickly. So go ahead, Ron, if you don't mind clicking on the next one. So um, you know, this, this webinar is about satellite data, but satellite data isn't the only data that exists out there. Um, NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office and Maryland Department of Resources and other groups, uh, they monitor water quality data around the Chesapeake Bay all the time. And this is a graph of dissolved oxygen data for that time when the fish started washing up uh, right at the end of December um, in 2011. And what you can see on this graph is that on the left-hand side, um, it starts around 1210, so about the 10th of December and runs through the end of the month. Um, but at no time in this entire period does the dissolved oxygen end up going below um, roughly 10 parts per million or milligrams per liter. Um, so back on that earlier slide, I mentioned that 0.8 milligrams per liter is what spot need if they, if they experience water quality conditions with less than that in terms of oxygen, um, they'll start to die. So um, Ron, you can go ahead and click to that next slide. So the question is like, was it dissolved oxygen in this case? Um, and the answer is, nah, <laughs> uh, it wasn't. Um, the conditions, they stayed above 10 the whole time. And, and like I said, um, spot are fairly tolerant of dissolved oxygen levels being pretty low. Um, so go ahead, Ronnie, you can click to the next one. So, so the next thing we're going to just take a quick look at, because I was also on that list, and I think a couple people actually listed it, um, was temperature. And I don't know if people remember December 2010, um, but this data helps maybe jog some of our memories. Um, they, uh, so, so around about early December, we were looking at a temperature of about 10 degrees Celsius. Um, 
just at the start of December. And that temperature dropped precipitously within that first week um, and went from 10 to down below four degrees Celsius in, in, pretty, in pretty quick turnaround. Um, so Ron, if you can go ahead and click to that next one. Um, and you can look at this data from, from buoys that are out there in the Chesapeake Bay, but luckily you can also access this data via satellite. So the, the graph on the, on the left-hand side of your screen is temperature data from one of our buoys over time. And that same time period roughly is graphed on the right-hand side using the satellite data and the ERDAP tool that Ron's gonna show us a little bit more about in a minute. But in both cases, you can see a really, really fast decline in temperature in the earlier part of the month. Um, so go ahead, Ron, you can click to that next one. And that uh, fast temperature decline, um, well, is kind of the question, right? Is that to blame? Um, and so a little bit more detail on spot uh, is that there is a lot of mortality that occurs in spot between the temperature of five and 10 degrees or, or seven and a half average. You can see what that is in Kelvin because the, the satellite data is reported actually in Kelvin as well. And, um, and the red line on that graph actually shows where uh, roughly 10 degrees, or I'm sorry, where seven and a half degrees is. So you can see that, yeah, in, uh, in December, in the early part of December, temperatures dropped and they dropped quickly. So Ron, you can click to that next slide. So in this case, um, it looks like from just the two things we looked at and we didn't look at the whole host of things, but there seems to be an indication that a rapid drop in temperature led to the, the mortality of these fish. Um, and this is something that you don't hear about every year. You don't see it every year. Um, and, I, and so like up here on the screen right now, you see just a comparison between the temperature in uh, 2010, 2011, and then the year before. And one of the things I hope you're seeing in that graph is that um, the temperature decline happened quickly uh, in 2010, but not so much in 29. And 29 was more of an average year. Um, and so these, these spot are very, um, vulnerable to these rapid temperature changes. And um, you can go ahead and click to that next slide. And it turns out uh, that when, when they did a little bit more work on this, uh, the Department of Natural Resources of Maryland looked closely and found indeed that that rapid drop in temperature was actually the cause of this, um, this fish mortality event. And in some circles, um, people don't see quite as many spot around as they used to. I don't know if that's been validated, but it's interesting to think about that this, this large event um, you know, had an impact for a while on spot populations in the Chesapeake. Um, but it's kind of a cool story, interesting phenomenon, not the happiest, but it provides us a, a window into looking at how environmental data can be used to understand some of these phenomena. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Ron. Okay, uh, thank you, Bart. Um, so, are there any questions for Bart about uh, what we just heard? And I'll just add, if, if people are um, putting stuff in, that um, one of the things that we're working on, we have this tool called Chesapeake Exploration, and that activity we kind of just went through um, is a, an activity that we are working on getting posted up there so that uh, either you can share it with students or um, you know, students can access it directly if they're interested. And yes, spot do taste fantastic. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I'm not seeing a lot of questions uh, right now. So if they do come to mind, please don't hesitate to put them in there and we'll, we'll kind of deal with them in the, in the chat environment. But um, I'm gonna, I think, turn it back over to Ron and we're gonna play with the ERDAP tool now. I will say, um, you know, one thing just to keep in mind and Elise will put the, uh, the address back in there is where you can get to um, the webinar recordings and things like that just so you have access to it as well. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Ron uh, and I see a couple of questions that I'm gonna um, respond to just in the chat. So Ron, take it away. Yeah, we're not gonna do the uh, playtime first. First, I'm gonna give a demo and um... Uh, let me see if I can switch to that. Okay. This should work. So now uh, do people see, uh, uh, it's a web browser with ERD app in the upper left-hand corner? Yep, yep, we see that. See, okay. Yep. 
Thanks. Yeah. So this is what the URDAP, you go to the, um, uh, the URL for URDAP. Uh, this is what the, uh, this is the first page that you get to. And uh, if you click on the right hand side here, you get a, a list of all the data sets that are on this URDAP server. Uh, at the moment, it's taking a while but there are over 100 data sets. So that's a really long list. And um, I'm not even going to show you that. It's a long list. It's hard to look through. So instead, uh, what I'm going to do for you is a search of uh, what we're interested in. And um, uh, I wrote one in here already, East Coast water temperature. And we'll do a search on that. And now we get a list of those data sets. And um, uh, there are six of them. And I know uh, that I wanted to show you the sea surface temperature that's monthly. So uh, what we do is go to the make a graph column and I want to make a graph of this monthly sea surface temperature. And that gives us the interface that I showed you before in the slide. So this is the temperature data set. And uh, what we're, we want to do here is zoom in to the Chesapeake Bay so we can click on the map to uh, specify a new center point. So let's do that. And that um, brought us in a little bit and put Chesapeake Bay in the center. And now we can zoom. We can zoom in. Uh, if we do zoom in two times, that'll uh, take us further in. And let's do that again. And uh, now we have a, uh, that's a pretty decent map of Chesapeake Bay water temperature. And it's the water temperature for the latest monthly, uh, monthly average water temperature. And so Ron, just to, to highlight, um, you just kind of clicked in the Chesapeake Bay and then clicked on the zoom in buttons to get to that, that level. So you, from the big map, just click in the bay. Yes, just click in the map itself and then use these buttons. So this is the uh, latest month, that's March of 2020. If we click on the back, uh, the minus sign, that will back us up uh, to earlier months. So now this is February of uh, 2020, and you can see the uh, temperature is colder in February. So now I'm going to use the slider bar. And uh, let's go back to this last summer. So here's August of 2019, and our uh, map did not update. So what I'm going to do is click down here on the left bottom, uh, redraw the graph. And uh, now we have the summertime temperature. And you can see, of course, for the summertime, the data is shows us a lot warmer water temperature. Hey, Ron. Just a, a uh -huh. quick point of um, how the, the webinar seems to be operating is that every time the screen refreshes, it just takes a minute for the, the GoToWebinar to catch up. Um, uh -huh. So um, I, I guess uh, just we just need to be conscious of the amount of times that we refresh, I think, on this. Oh, this OK. Week. All right. So, um, so I think by now people can see the uh, warmer water temperature for Chesapeake Bay. And um, uh, say we really like this map and we want to save it, what we can do is below the redraw of the graph, we can uh, set the file type and download the data or image. So uh, I know that I want an image file. These are lots of different um, image types or data types. I know I'm going to want a PNG image, so something that I can uh, email to someone or post on a web page or post on social media. And now I'm going to hit, I selected PNG, and now I'm going to hit the um, download the data or image. Um, so now uh, you can see that um, uh, we have that PNG file as, um, as a single image. And um, uh, sorry, we have the map as a single uh, image, and this is a PNG file. So if just like any time with a image on the web, you can do a right click and do a save image as. So you can save that to your device or your laptop. 
Uh, I also want to point out that this URL at the top is a, a really long and crazy URL, but uh, this is the URL to this specific um, uh, PNG image. So everything in the URL is what specifies what makes this PNG image uh, from the data set that we selected in the beginning. So that's really useful. You can, you can um, bookmark this URL um, and come back to it. You can copy the URL and put it in an email and send it to someone. And when they click the URL, they will get this exact um, this exact image that you made. Um, so now I just use the back. I uh, what I did from that page is I used the back button to go back to uh, our make a graph page. Um, uh, you can always use the back button to go back to what you had done before, or say you didn't like what you just did. The back button is really useful to undo. Uh, either go back or undo what you just did. Uh, so now we made a map. I also want to make a line graph. So here in uh, graph type at the top, there's a menu and I'm going to select lines and markers. So that's a line graph with the markers of the data. And um, um, uh, so it gave us a line graph and a, um, a short interval here. Uh, now, what I forgot to do in our map, and again, I'm going to use my back button to back up, is that we're going to make this uh, graph for a particular location in Chesapeake Bay. We're going to make a time graph, so a trend graph. So I'm just going to pick an easy whole numbers here. There's negative 76 longitude and 37 latitude. So I'm making a note of that. And I go forward again, and for the latitude, that was 36. Uh, and for the uh, longitude, oh, maybe I got that wrong. Is that right? Um, 76. That's what it was. Uh, 76 and 36, and I want to expand the time period here. So Bart showed you this temperature in Chesapeake Bay that uh, caused the spot uh, fish kill. So let's go back to, um, uh, let's say the beginning of 2009. And uh, we don't need to see all the years. Let's go to the beginning of 2015. And now we have our point in Chesapeake Bay and our time range. I'm gonna click on redraw the graph. So I am hoping now you see a trend graph um, that is showing us over the set of years from 2009 to 2015, the uh, changes in temperature from summertime to wintertime. And uh, now this gives us some different information. We can look over these years and uh, look at that. The, um, uh, that particular time period that Bart was talking about was the coldest winter out of this set of years. Um, so that really was uh, 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 remarkable, uh, or at least for this time period, and what caused the spot fish kill. Uh, what's also really interesting, we can see how the winters and summers were different. So the, uh, the following winter was an extraordinarily warm. Uh, and then uh, uh, summers, there were some hot summers and some uh, not so hot summers that were um, a bit cooler. Um, so the, the trend graph gives us a lot of interesting information. And then like before, we, um, uh, we can do the same thing. We can save the file as a PNG image uh, and do the uh, download. Uh, download data or image and do like we did before. We can save that. Uh, or what's also really interesting uh, or perhaps useful for the classroom is uh, instead I selected now uh, uh, CSV as the file type. And CSV files are importable into Excel. So when I click on download the data, that will download a CSV file for Excel 
into uh, onto my laptop. I'm not going to do that right now. What I did was um, uh, I did that earlier. So I'm just I just want to show you the uh, the Excel file. Um, the Excel file now shows for the graph that we made from that data. This is showing us the months and then uh, the temperatures for those months. So now that we brought it into Excel, I mean, you could, I imagine with your students, you could do things like make a graph in Excel, or you could do math using spreadsheet math functions or things like that. So, um, um, so that's, that's really useful. Um, let's see, and then, uh, okay. Yeah, and then similarly, one could um, save this URL and like we did before with the map and people can go write, uh, people you share that URL with can go uh, right to the thing that it is that you made. So uh, now we're gonna come back to the, um, the presentation and now it's sandbox time. So that means it's play time for you to get your hands dirty with ERDAP. Um, and um, by dirty, what I mean is that uh, we're not trying to real we're not trying to achieve anything here. Uh, what I want you to do is to be able to get some familiarity with that interface and um, uh, have a little bit of experience to uh, manipulate the sliders. And uh, if you get to making a map, if you get to uh, making a graph, that's great. Um, uh, but that's not that's not a uh, requirement. Uh, we only have a little bit of time, so um, just so that you get some familiarity, because we're going to come back and have discussion about your your experience with ERDAP. Um, so what you'll need to do is open a browser and uh, put in this URL, coastwatch.noaa.gov/erdap, and that's with two D's. E R D D A P, and um, uh, I just drop that into the chat box, so you can just probably click on that, and it'll take you right to the the ERDAP web page. I guess the uh, participants will need to like exit their full screen, I guess, or right. I'm not. I don't have that option. Um, so if you open your browser and go there, I'm assuming people can um, uh, can do that. And if uh, you can't, then uh, put your question wherever you're having trouble, put that question into the chat box. Uh, and then maybe Elise or Krista can uh, read me if, uh, read the if their questions uh, on the uh, logistics of operating that uh, ERDAP website, then I can try to answer that. But on that page, once you get to the page uh, on your browser, then uh, we'll do a search like uh, I had done for you before. The search box is on the upper right hand side, and you can put in any one of these the East Coast water temperature uh, that I had put in, or monthly chlorophyll, or currents, or salinity. And I, I'm hoping that you're able to toggle in between. If you exit full screen from the GoToMeeting and bring up the browser, you can still toggle um, uh, and see the see what's on the slides here. So go ahead and enter any one of these, whichever one interests you, into the search box, um, and uh, then click Search uh, on that page, and you'll get a list of uh, some number of data sets, and you can pick. Uh, you can pick any one of those. Um, you can see if there's one that's more interesting to you. Um, uh, if you uh, once you pick the title, to the left of the title is the um, choice for doing a graph. So go ahead and pick graph. Ron, we have a, a question in the chat from Amy in West Virginia, um, and she's wondering if ERDAP um, mapping works for rivers and kind of inland folks. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, ERDAP is primarily oceanographic data, so we're not going to get uh, the land data for inland. 
but um, the satellite data is usually at a spatial resolution or what, what uh, is offered um, by NOAA and these programs about, you know, that are studying the environment, the resolution of the satellite data is too coarse to see the fine detail in a river. If you have a river that's, um, you know, a couple hundred feet across, the uh, satellite is uh, measuring at an um, um, interval that is, uh, you know, at best several hundred uh, meters across, usually more like a kilometer. So uh, the satellite can't see something as detailed as a river. If you had something as wide, quite a, you know, a couple miles across like Chesapeake Bay, then, uh, then we can see that. But unfortunately, no. Um, most of the rivers are not available, except if you get to high resolution satellite data. But um, um, uh, we're working towards that in NOAA Coast Watch to be able to show you lakes and rivers. Um, but we don't have that. You can't select that today. Oh, okay. So um, now you uh, opened up your data set and you have a map there. So what I've put onto the um, the go to meeting screen are different things that you can try. And uh, this is just your play time to do whatever you would like, uh, try out the controls, and you can use the go to meeting slide as a guide. It kind of walks through what I had done in the demo. So um, you can click on your location of interest on the map and use the uh, zoom in buttons. Um, uh, you can undo by using the browser's back button. Uh, you can move the, the time sliders. If you do that, you probably have to redo, press the redraw the graph button, which is down on the left-hand side. Uh, with the time slider, you can compare uh, how that data is different at different times. Um, so if you get to a map that you like, that'll um, uh, that's already something that's, uh, wonderful. Uh, and then there are instructions here on the, on the, uh, go to meeting slide for, uh, if you want to switch to a, you have your map and you want to switch to, a, a line graph, the instructions are there. So I'm going to be quiet for a couple minutes. Uh, if there are questions, then use the chat. So, Ron, um, we have, oh, go ahead. No, at least you can go ahead. That's good. Um, so Jody is wondering, she says when she's trying to look at the salinity in the bay, she's getting pixelated boxes in the ocean, but nothing in the Chesapeake Bay itself. Um, any idea how to triage that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I'm sorry to, I guess, maybe I tricked you a little bit in the a very early part of the slide, I was talking about the oceanographic satellite data types relevant to Chesapeake Bay. There actually isn't salinity data for Chesapeake Bay. So I wasn't meaning to trick you, but if you had an interest for out in the open ocean, that's where the satellites can uh, collect salinity data. So it's, um, uh, there are um, uh, technical uh, reasons why in measuring salinity, the land interferes with the water signal. So the land signal is completely uh, removed and that interference area in coastal areas is not included. Um, so if you pick salinity, you know, stay with that and, um, you know, um, pick in something um, that might look interesting out in one of the oceans out there, uh, but the coastal data is not going to be there. And uh, as also in the question is the uh, the pixelation, that is data that's even at the salinity data is at a spatial resolution that's even more coarse. So um, uh, so yeah, what you see, you're not going to be able to zoom into a really fine area. And it's similar if you pick currents, that's really similar also, that there is little data for coastal areas, um, 
the data is more meant for the open ocean um, or farther out from the coast, and that is also more pixelated. But if you pick currents, a really cool feature to look at is the Gulf Stream. Yeah, and um, one other thing that uh, we didn't mention earlier, just so you know, like the, the steps to go through to generate the the maps or or the the time series data, um, Ron put together a tutorial, like basically step by step instructions how to do some basic work with this too. Which um, with the webinar, we'll also be sharing that document as well, um, it, as a as kind of a first draft and the thing to help you get to um, to get to the data. And I forgot but beside that uh, tutorial that Bart just mentioned, that's a Word document. Uh, there's also an online tutorial, and I forgot to put that uh, an online tutorial from NOAA Coastwatch, and um, I forgot to put that in the slides. So uh, we'll add that in. All right, we do want to get to um, uh, some discussion. So um, uh, you can try this now. You can do some of that sharing of your work. Um, so below the redraw the graph, if you haven't yet, you can select a file type like PNG and then do a download of the data. Uh, or if you have a graph, you can do the same thing. You can save the image of your graph as a PNG file, uh, but you can also try selecting CSV from the list and then downloading the, um, uh, downloading the CSV file, the data. Uh, and you can also try copying that URL and emailing it to yourself or just bookmarking it. And then um, at some point after this webinar, you can then go back and open the PNG image file that you made, post it to social media. Um, uh, you can open your CSV file and make a graph in Excel. Uh, you can go to your bookmark. Uh, you can uh, uh, email your URL to someone else. Uh, and you can also, since it's a URL, you can put that into a web page or onto a blog. So uh, with that URL, you can just keep on playing with the what uh, what you've already been working on. Yeah, and um, like tools like this, there's tons of data out there um, from NOAA, from NASA, from USGS. There's all accessible, and they're really I don't know. I always think they're fantastic tools to support education programming. Um, so we do thank you for interest you're interested in learning about this satellite data as well and like maybe ron if you don't mind can you uh click to that discussion slide real quick yes just because we're running kind of short on time and um you know if folks want to drop some ideas based on that quick exploration uh into the chat box of any of these questions um we'd, we'd love to hear them uh as well as you know if if, uh, if you add advice or ideas about how ERDAP can be um, used by educators or what kind of supports you need on that side, um, we'd love to hear that too. And I also uh, want to make sure that you have um, our contact information. I think, Ron, that's on like one of the last slides, right? In case you wanted to reach out and explore a little bit more about that. And is it, is it okay? I can just put it in the chat box so people can get our emails there as well. Yes, oh, there it is. Cool. Ron, just put it up. Because um, we would love to work with you on, uh, you know, any, any interest you have in accessing this data, we'd love to work with you on that if, if desired. Um, um, but so, yeah, please add your, uh, since it's just, we're uh, just going to uh, finish up with discussion, if there are uh, thoughts uh, you can put in the chat box. I'm also wondering if other people can be unmuted and uh, people can voice what they thought. Like, what do you think about, would, is 
ERDAP? Was it too complicated? Would you try using it in a classroom setting or in a, if you're informal educators in your institution setting? Um, um, yeah. And um, if uh, Bart and I uh, put some effort into making uh, some an education application that incorporated ERDAP, would you use that? Um, or what was, you know, is the mapping more interesting than the graphing or the other way around or uh, what else would you like to see? Yeah, and um, cool. So yeah, it looks like some, some chats are coming in with some ideas some thoughts on how to use it. Um, which is awesome. Thank you very much. And if folks want to be unmuted because they want to speak their piece, just let me know in the chat and I can unmute you. I will, I will say that, um, you know, kind of approaching that time when we did set for the end of the, the webinar. So the plan is, you know, Ron and I'll stay on for questions and discussion. Um, and if others need to beg off, please do. But the, the biggest thing is, thank you very much for joining us here. And Ron, if you don't mind clicking just quickly to that next slide of the, the next follow-up webinars um, really quickly. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, whoops. Yeah. So uh, there are a number of other webinars coming up here in the short term. And uh, if you want to join us on any of those, you'll be hearing about them um, probably in the same way you heard about this one. Uh, but thank you for your time. And like I said, Ron and I will stay on here for a few more minutes to see if there's questions that come up that we can help you work through or deal with. Otherwise, thanks and enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoon.